good morning and thank you for joining us for our program on this Lord's Day morning. I hope that you're doing well and I would love to extend an invitation to you to join us in services today at Pyburn Street Church of Christ. We will come together this morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study followed by worship at 9.50. We will also gather this evening at 6 o'clock for our end of the month singing and devotional period. And this is always a very enjoyable and uplifting evening that we get to spend together lifting our voices and songs and praise to God. And we hope that you can come and join us for that service this evening. Also on Wednesday evenings at six o'clock, we have a period of Bible study where we have classes available for all ages. And our adult Bible class is engaged in a study of Christian evidences. And I've made mention over the last few weeks as we've been looking at these lessons on Sunday mornings in regard to various aspects of Christian evidences of how these lessons are a supplement to what we are studying in that class on Wednesday evenings. For anyone that's not able to join us for those classes but would like to still participate, each one of those classes are available on YouTube by going to youtube.com and typing in Pyburn Street Church of Christ. You'll be able to go down and find each one of these classes that we've had thus far on the subject of Christian evidences. But we would love for you to come and be with us in person as we study this very important subject of Christian evidences. How do we defend the things that we believe? Well, this morning, we're going to continue along this same train of thought by looking at the subject, the evidence for the existence of God. Is there any evidence really for the existence of God? Well, we're going to be looking at this in a series of lessons over the next few weeks. But before I begin, I want to plug a, a book that I've been able to glean a lot of excellent information from. In fact, much of what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks is going to come from research that has been done by Brother Brad Harib in a book entitled Convicted, Investigating Christian Evidences. The Bible and science and the human body, are they by accident or are they by design? Well, Brother Wayne Jackson has written a very, very good book on this subject, and I would encourage you to look into that as well. Now, I'm only going to be covering a very small portion of what these books cover. So if you're interested in studying this subject more in depth, I would encourage you to look into these works by Brother Wayne Jackson and Brother Brad Harib. I'm sure many of us can remember back in high school in our science classes, and maybe if we did not participate in this ourselves, we've seen it uh, in movies or even seen some of our classmates using Bunsen burners in science classes. And while most of the time those experiments that we did didn't really turn out all that well, it gave us our first taste of what's known as the scientific method. And the scientific method is described as a body of techniques that allow for observation of a particular phenomenon. Well, the scientific method is limited to sense perception. If you cannot physically examine a thing and thoroughly test it, then it cannot qualify as being a scientific fact or a law. The steps that are necessary for something to become a scientific fact are first, there must be an observation of fact. This means that it must be able to be perceived by one of our five senses. Secondly, there must be a statement of a problem. This is where someone makes their best guess as to why a thing is happening. This is also known as a hypothesis. Well, the hypothesis must be tested to see if it is true or false. And even though tests may be done that support the hypothesis, if those things are proven to be true, then it becomes known as a theory. But please understand that a theory really does not prove anything. It just means that there is enough evidence available to warrant further testing. Well, then the final stage is when the theory has been thoroughly tested from all angles and has proven to be true. Then, 
it becomes a law. Now I want to emphasize that if a thing cannot be tested, then it should not be called a hypothesis, a theory, or a law, which means that the origin of the universe or the origin of man cannot be properly labeled as such because man cannot test it with his five senses. And this is why some scientists have been forced to admit that human evolution is not a credible theory. However, this fact has not slowed down some scientists from proclaiming evolution as being a fact. We need to understand, though, that our children are being taught this scientific method in high school and on up into their college years. They impress upon our young people that if they cannot measure a thing with their five senses and then replicate the results, then it is not real. Well, friends, once a child has been taught this idea from a very young age, when they grow up, they begin to believe it as a fact. And the reason this is so dangerous is because anything found outside the scientific method is considered a fantasy. So guess where that leaves God and the miracles that we read about in the Bible? Well, those who firmly place their allegiance in science will often dismiss the idea of God and what it means. There's no way to put an accurate number on how many pews that remain empty today because of the influence of the scientific method. But no doubt thousands have been convinced by atheism, humanism, and evolution that either God is dead or never existed in the first place. Well, for the most part, the media is quick to jump on anything that speaks against Christianity and the existence of God. There are numerous websites that are dedicated to proving to others that God does not exist. And they encourage young people to free themselves from the bonds of religion and live a life of freedom. Well, unfortunately, people pushing this kind of false message have won the hearts of many, and they continue to win more converts to their side. It's as Jesus said in Matthew 23 and verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is won... You make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Well, over the last 20 years, we have seen major changes in our nation and in the way that people think. This idea of erasing God from our lives started out as something small and insignificant, and it's now spreading across our land like a cancer. We can see this in the way that many of our young people view God and how many of them are so self-centered. We've seen conservative policies that got their foundation from the principles of the Bible challenged and overturned in our court systems. And some would love to have anything that has anything to do with God to be completely erased from our history and from our lives forever. In the year 1892, there was a ruling in the case known as the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States. And in this case, the Supreme Court went on record stating that the United States was a Christian nation. And while they used that term Christian very loosely, the idea was that majority of people believed in God and in Jesus as his son. But in the years since that time, since that statement was made by our Supreme Court, our nation has changed drastically. For example, in the year 2002, the liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California ruled that the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance was unconstitutional. In fact, the court said, in the context of the pledge, the statement that the United States is a nation under God is an endorsement of religion. It is a profession of a religious belief, namely a belief in monotheism, A profession that we are a nation under God is identical for establishment clause purposes to a profession that we are a nation under Jesus, a nation under Vishnu, a nation under Zeus, or a nation under no God, because none of these professions can be neutral with respect to religion. This statement coming from Judge Alfred T. Goodwin. Now these judges took it upon themselves to say that God had not done enough for mankind to be singled out. As far as they were concerned, God Almighty was no different than the mythical God Zeus. 
Well, of course, we've seen several instances of liberal judges like these in California making decisions that go against God and what his word teaches. Thankfully, their decisions are not the final say for our nation, but their decisions are stepping stones that can lead to devastating changes of our laws across the nation. If left unchallenged, it's possible that the Supreme Court that once stated that we are a Christian nation would then turn around and start declaring that we are an anti-Christian nation. And friends, we are well on our way to that point. But if we keep losing our children to the philosophies of men, one day we may find that all public declarations of God, the Bible, or Christianity will have to be removed, which includes our national motto, In God We Trust. Military graveyards would no longer be able to use crosses for headstones. Religious ceremonies for government officials and the military would have to cease. Public prayer before sporting or civic events would be outlawed. And the president would no longer be sworn into office with his hand on the Bible. Now, if you don't think that this can become a reality in our nation, then friends, you are fooling yourself. We have at least two generations that have been influenced by atheism, which has implanted in their minds that everything must be proven by the scientific method or it does not exist. Some Christians are being shocked by their children coming out of college who then come home and tell them that they no longer believe in God because God cannot be proven with one of our five senses. Well, since God is a spirit, according to John 4 and verse 24, His existence cannot be proven by our five senses. So does this mean that God does not exist? Well, of course not. Well, can we prove that God exists? Well, the answer is yes. We can prove the existence of God by using logic and reason. Now, I'm going to share with you a few arguments that offer proof for the existence of God. And when I say proof, I do not mean scientific proof, but I mean logical proof. These arguments are something that I wish every young person could hear and examine for themselves. Well, our first argument is known as the cosmological argument, and this argument states that every creation must have a creator. Now, it doesn't take a special telescope to prove that the universe exists. All you have to do is look around, and your surroundings will testify to the fact that this earth exists. You can look up into the sky and see the sun and the moon and the stars, And that proves that they exist. But the question becomes, where did our universe come from? Well, there's only three possible answers to this question. First, our universe is eternal. Or in other words, it's always existed. Well, the second idea would be that our universe created itself from nothing. Or thirdly, our universe was created by something or someone. Now, some atheists and evolutionists will teach that our universe is eternal, but that does not fit the scientific data which we have. It has been proven that our universe is expanding, which is clear indication that it had a beginning. An an evolutionist by the name of Robert Jastrow, he admitted the lingering decline predicted by astronomers for the end of the world differs from the explosive conditions they've calculated for its birth. But the impact is the same. Modern science denies an eternal existence to the universe, either in the past or in the future. Even those who teach the Big Bang Theory have to conclude that our universe had a beginning. And this rules out our universe as being eternal. Any sane, unbiased scientist will also admit that it is ludicrous to suggest that our universe created itself from nothing. One cannot get something from nothing. If you believe that we can get something from nothing, then I would like to sell you a whole lot of nothing. Well, we've now eliminated two of our options for the existence of the universe. But then think about this. The fact that our universe exists and that it had a beginning means that it came into existence by something or someone that is eternal. Because if something cannot come from nothing, then our universe had to come from something or some person 
that is eternal. And that something, or better yet, someone, is God. Just as we read in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Friends, I encourage you to consider these things that we've discussed and make plans to join us again next Sunday morning at 8 o'clock for the continuation of this study on the existence or the evidence for the existence of God. Friends, we pray that God blesses you today with a wonderful day.